students, anyone tuning in, urbanism and digital narratives after COVID. We have live from, well, not live for you, live from Singapore, Joan Kelly, professor, artist, world traveler, has traveled around the world with many grants based out of NTU at Singapore. Um, she is of European descent, uh, grew up in Baltimore, and a Yankee, Americana. Um, um, and I wanted in this lecture, as this is in the new globalism department at Stony Brook, we're talking about things global, identity and the city, global cities, which Singapore often hits the top 10, even though it's about 6 million people compared to Tokyo at 37 million in these Chinese cities. Um, even Osaka is bigger than New York, though. So what makes, in Joan's view, I know there's a top 10 of what makes a global city. Um, New York and London are the top two global cities, and they're, they're Western, they're European, as it were. Um, but what, what makes that city? Why did little Singapore vie for that uh, capacity? And, and with Joan, what, what, what is it like to be a white woman artist in this Singaporean context? Um, we're going to be critical, but we're going to be fair, warts and all. Um, we're going to be Socratic and talk about the, the pros and cons. Um, and it's not to, uh, these lectures aren't to denigrate a certain place for hypocrisies or being less than what they say. Certainly New York is a lot less than the hype. But um, as these cities vie for global status as financial, diverse, um, branded, branded value um, uh, cities in a confluence of, of, of financial markets, what does it mean? Joan, welcome. You can launch from there. <laughs> Thank you, Philip Baldwin. Nice to be here. Nice to um, Brooklyn, have a chat Singapore. With there you go. And all the students that are watching. And yes, here I am. At, um, this is uh, uh, just after ten at night in Singapore. Uh, so I'm I'm in my room here, just uh, relaxing. So. Uh, you know, you one of the things you mentioned was diversity, and Singapore certainly has the diversity. We don't have the same ethnic groups as you have in the U.S., but we're an extremely diverse uh, country. We have three main eth ethnic groups, um, Chinese, which are the majority, Indian, and Malay. And Singapore used to be a part of Malaysia, which is our closest neighbor. Uh, we have, um, besides the 6 million people, we have another 2 million foreign workers that are here. Between wow, the, 2 million. Uh, yeah. Working yeah. on all those projects. And uh, as I remember, sometimes they're living in cargo containers. They still do that? And it, um, I mean, that's me too. I mean, I'm, I'm considered a foreigner. Oh, so there's two million, maybe out of six million people, two million are foreigners. No, no, two million on top of that. Oh, so maybe eight so million about people. Eight million altogether. In that little archipelago. Wow. Yeah, in that teeny little place. Which, of course, um, was strategically the reason why Raffles and the English bought this swampland 50 miles north of the equator. At least people know it isn't always hot and rainy. Um, that he made a sultan buy it so he could buy it back from him. They infilled it, um, but it's extremely militarily and um, trade-wise, extremely strategic. Because I even heard that 60, 70 percent of East Asia's oil has to come through the Straits yeah, of Malacca. You have to go, go past Singapore, and that, that's our. Um, the port, of course, is one of our um, uh, GDP. We also refine oil. Oh, and, and refine it still do over there near NTU, right? Yeah. You can smell it in the morning, right? Yeah, we can. And we try to be the most efficient and, and uh, uh, do the most efficient job at uh, um, refining oil. We also purify water. 
Wow. So we don't have any real, um, you know, um, natural resources here. But you make don't... you make the handshake as one of the requirements oh, of a of a. Oh, also banking. It, it was when I was there. It was touted as the Switzerland of Southeast Asia, that people try because it was so law and order, a place of law and order exactly. amongst amongst Here Southeast in, yeah. Asia, which is a little more jungly, anarchic, mm -hmm. in terms of trust. Um, it wanted to be the Switzerland of Southeast Asia, an offshore place to store your monies, no question asked. But also, in contrast to that, there, when I was there, there were speedboats with 50 caliber machine guns mounted on the front with Straits of Malacca pirates. Do they still exist? Oh, I have no idea. So you haven't heard any piracy? Um, no, I have not. Have not. Because that was a big story about uh, professors buying these large sailboats from yachts even from uh financiers they get it for a song and they'd sail up and down the straits of malaccas and everyone said watch out for pirates um just mm -hmm. coming out of indonesia i think plenty of you know before the pandemic we were we had plenty of you know wealthy people taking their boats out but um i i don't i don't know about the pirates um uh, there has been, I mean, the New York Times did a huge uh, piece over some years about um, uh, Thai boats. Um, you know, Myanmar was the last, the latest, I'd say in the last 10 years, um, group of uh foreign workers that came into southeast asia and so many people from like myanmar and lao uh who were you know needed jobs they'd offer them a job and take them out on these fishing boats and never bring them back they were just like indentured servants on these boats. on fishing boats fishing 24 7. yes wow. yes and and a lot of them were who is Indonesia. doing this the singaporean no, 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 these are Thai. 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 This is in oh, Singapore. No, but wow. they were over in uh, all around Southeast Asia and in Indonesian waters. Indonesia also caught them. Um, wow. But not, not, essentially slavery, even... essentially chattel slavery. Exactly. Yes, yes. Wow. Yes. So. No, I heard that slavery, and you, let's uh, just for my students, Joan gets these wonderful grants. Uh, Singapore is a wonderful granting society, city, government, so she's gotten all these grants to go work with, um, uh, in, well, for a long time, brothels in India, brothels in um, Morocco, too, working with the women, trying to understand no, Morocco, women's issues. They were um, girls that are incarcerated in Morocco, young girls, um, for all kinds of various reasons. Your your mother could have you as an illegitimate child, um, or there was some kind of, something happened in the family. Maybe she was raped by an uncle, and she was accused and put in, in the jail. Wow. Um, so you... There was, I was there. There was a nine-year-old girl with that story. Um, oh. Maybe the mother just couldn't feed her daughter. So there were all different reasons. So they go to jails, and if they ever hope to get out of jails, they pretty much go to brothels. Well, um, no. Uh, at, when they're 18, they're just let go. Onto and the streets. Said, right. Without any support system that can be an eventuality um, for them. But there are a lot of people trying to, um, trying to do something about that situation, trying to give the girls support, uh, trying to create halfway a halfway house kind of idea. But this is to, um, the, to the credit of the Singaporean government giving you, a white woman, grant money to go into these you're pushing the boundaries of what it means what it means to be a woman in a global society what are the extremes what 
you know, and it's to credit the Singaporean what government saying, you know, I want to be in their space and see and and share with them and find out how they feel, what their lives are like, what their. But what? here's what I'm saying, Joan, is to the credit of the Singaporean granting agencies, NGOs, universities, they said to you, this is very worthy. Here's the money. Go do it and come back with the research, which you usually went in and painted like we used to do in Geelong, used to paint with these people just to get their stories or paint them. Um, the painting was a the painting is a a point of engagement like I can't just go into the brothel and just you know say hi I'm here let you know let me talk with you but um, someone introduced me someone who knew a lot of the women uh, brought me into the brothel with them and you know he asked them for me if they would like to pose for the paintings and we set up they would pay I would pay them as my models right and I you those women loved making money in a different way right. and they set up the they set up the amount I would pay and it was a way for me to spend time with them and to see what's going on and to really be there for not just an hour or a few hours but for days on end wow all day. and I hired them to make food for me and um I brought sketchbooks and and crayons and markers and all these things for the kids. But so a lot of a lot of it to the credit of this strange prickly Singaporean, which is known around the world as a draconian society. But this this is a very liberal gesture. It's like Joan, or I remember when you and I would go to the red light district just to draw and paint the people, just to hear their stories of like where, where, again, we go with a purpose, we go with art, as it were. How did this reflect upon your identity as a Western woman, a white woman in Singapore, um, when this is this very, and I remember our article in the Wall Street Journal, India Times, like these, these Westerners will go to the red light district and draw people just to, hear their stories or you know they th might think it's odd on the sheen of Singapore but they were very they were very open to this they were very you know it's exposing warts and all you know uh, to a society how do you I wouldn't say that Singapore is I exactly open to that but um I mean yeah I mean we did that that was it was Friday night it was a way to get to know this society I was new here you were new here um, other than just and, drinking with them or just sitting at a table it was an engagement exactly. and you see um, they got to know me so they they knew my work after a while so they could and they started to say I like this I don't like this you know everyone's a connoisseur so I started this dialogue about art here with these people that are totally outside the art world. Right. And I remember one of the bylines was, you know, two NTU professors go in to capture the beauty and ugliness. I remember that line. And even though Toulouse Lautrec and the French Impressionists used to go into brothels and you know paint well, you know we could be very practical about this you know you couldn't have gone to robertson key where all the uh, downtown businessmen were coming and uh to continue just talking and all the um wealthy uh white foreigners uh clark were, key and all of that yes, yeah. who had quite well-paying jobs and uh businesses here in singapore um, you would go there, not a person would turn around and talk to you. But when we went to, down to Geelong, everybody was talking from table to table. So we just set really up a, a little sketchbook and a little portable watercolor just, thing. Really open atmosphere. It, it was inviting, it was engaging, and the people, the people wanted to, the people wanted to talk. And we, we so, did get stories or at least drawings from the three sectors almost openly. The the um, the so-called pimps, the the prostitutes, and the Johns. It seemed to be 
somewhat flu- less so the Johns, but uh, seem to be fluid. What what? Um, I like to just think of all the you know. Pe- um, people came there for all different reasons, but some people just a lot of men just come there to to hang out, really just to hang out. Right. Um, because they're know, part of that two million construction crew working well, no, on these sites. No, not, not necessarily. There's a there were a lot of uh, Chinese men down there, just hanging out. Uh, you know, uh, a woman sits down next to them, and she looks at him like a man. Oh, like the man, you Inst- know, instead of a paycheck or of, you know, no, right. instead of like going home to his wife who does, who's like, hey, I, I cleaned up after you for 20 years. I'm, I'm kind of sick of you right now. <laughs> you know what oh, I mean? Right, right, right. Getting that kind of attention. It was a whole different attention there. So I aesthetics mean, and drawing and projects like this, just setting up and doing something that didn't bring us any money we're sitting there we we did pay some of our subjects we would ask I was spending the money i was paying the subjects right <laughs> and then who would i was trying to remember i was giving away the port little drawing portraits to them but um you know i paid them because they were posing for me i mean right. i'm the artist and i'm paying my model and I kept the painting. If they wanted to keep the painting, I wouldn't have paid them. They right. could have the painting if they wanted. We, but you know, they all wanted the money. <laughs> so. Right. Wow. So let's. Yeah, ref- that was fine with me too, because I have all the paintings, and and for me, it's. Oh, and then you did life. shows with these paintings, right? I did, I have done a couple of shows um, with the paintings, and with the newspaper articles that. Um, that they wrote about, you know, because they said um, in some of the the articles, um, you know, like they were just, you know, kind of shocked. Uh, what what did the one cafe owner say? Um, that was uh, one of the headlines. Um, anyway, I'll think of it in a minute. But uh, for us to be there painting. You know, they were saying, why would anybody spend time painting these people? Well, they used the word ugly. You know, they said, this is the... Oh, that's right. They did. They the said, unseemly they said, underneath... Why are you painting all these ugly people? Yes. When downtown exactly you had bed, ba- bed, Bath & Beyond and Body Shop and all of this... Why are you painting all these ugly people? Um, I would... Uh, I would understand if, if they painted beautiful things and landscapes, but why all these ugly people? Right. Um, so, you know, the newspaper articles show this kind of hierarchy that's here, you know, in, in, in the, it's still very prevalent here in Singapore. But it was a very strange, we call it nouveau riche, the Hudson Yards over here are filled with all these franchise um, stores, um, upscale, I forget most of them, but the Hugo Boss, whatever, that these would be, and I remember this in, in China when I went there first in 2000, and then Vietnam, that the, these luxury malls do exist, but they exist as a sort of magnet to earn a, kind of a consumerist um, aspiration to the local people. Um, Singapore's and certainly like Korea, Singapore, Japan, all these other young dragons, Hong Kong, they went, well, now China has gone beyond that. Certainly they can afford it. Um, and that was certainly on a, on a post-industrial scale, that's kind of like Henry Ford's sort of um, uh, formula. You make your workers be able to afford the Model T that they're building. So make the bourgeois professional society Mm -hmm. able to afford these luxury items in these malls and Mm -hmm. not just you know uh, uh, agrarian peasants coming from the hinterland saying oh i wish i could you know afford a perfume at sephora 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 or something like that but getting back talk to yours about identity yourself as a western woman in singapore and why, and we have problems in the States about uh, nascent racism and 
prejudice and things like it and, and it's certainly clunky and it raises its ugly head here and there as in Minneapolis last summer but what what is how do you walk around Singapore as a Western woman what is well I think that um, I think it's you know we have different we have different problems because we have different histories between the US and Singapore but but there is the same issue of where the minority person is always perceived as that minority like as when a threat I, or something strange what, or what what as a threat because when um, societies, maybe East Asian, South Asian societies, see the Western woman, they they assume a lot. They assume that she's had a degree of feminism. Everybody assumes a lot about everybody, any minority, any minority. I just happen to be, you know, a white woman, but I'm perceived that way as they perceive white women in every transaction in from the news day. or from their exposure with white women, from their idea it that... Just from Hollywood. Hollywood. For Christ's sake. It could be from any any perceived idea. Even I may be buying something in a shop and or looking at buying something and, you know, they would make the comment that, you know, and just assume that I have a maid at home and assume the maid can be there to pick it up um you know when it's delivered i they would they don't just they don't even think that they would have to work around my work schedule oh i see but now no is this this so is just on this yeah. level in the every everyday everyday interactions um is always there always there you're responded to as how they perceive you um you know, just in simple, uh, simple things. They were taking us out to um, a team building exercise at NTU, and we had to ride a take a boat ride for five minutes. And the admin girl says to me, "Are you okay?" And I was saying, thinking to myself, "Okay, uh, yeah. Why? What? Well, the boat was shaking. I mean, for that second, I thought she thinks that I'm like a fairy princess." That had everything, you know, had some kind of, man, or, you know, red carpet put out for me. She doesn't know that I hitchhiked across country from Maryland to Alaska. Which is she an old colonial. And I sat in the back of pickups of um, whoever picked me up. Baltimore in the Yukon. girl. Baltimore girl. She has no idea. But you this, know, have- this harkens back to a colonialist idea that the Europeans came to colonize the area around Singapore and certainly they've had their tensions with the Islamic states of Malaysia and Indonesia and it's still about 60% ethnic Chinese in Singapore right? Yeah. What's the percentage of white folks in Singapore? Mm. Five, ten? Yeah, no, five, maybe. Five, because still five percent. Um, uh, but some are native. Some live, like we know, people were born there, uh, white folks were born there and grew up there, and, and you know, not not as many. So what... Yeah, no, it's not that big a percentage. Well, let's talk about Hollywood, like the perceptions coming in from Hollywood <laughs> that... Um, That's unfortunate. Yeah, that a Western woman really is is bringing in. This is just a cliche, but let's bring it up. A Western woman is bringing into Southeast Asia, Asia's millennial millennium of thousands of years old, uh, East Asia, South Asia, with these more or less patriarchal views. What is the Hollywood perception that the white woman, the Western woman, is bringing in? dangerous ideas about feminism does that hit (laughs) does that hit the landscape or not you know we don't really you know we we just you know we kind of keep our heads down here and just do our work 
But you mentioned you, someone saying, where's your husband, where, where, what's your husband do, and early oh, yeah. on. All the time. Yeah, everybody asks that. Um, and yeah, the girls here are expected, you know, the parents would like them to get married by 25. Um, and what happens if they go to further graduate studies? Later. They're getting married later. But you can't buy an HDB flat unless you're married. Really? Yeah. Any they, they any ethnicity? Have, any ethnicity? They do have some. They do have flats for single people, but um, they're very small, and and there yeah, there's a lot of. Um, I, I I haven't really looked into it because I'm not I'm not going to be buying one, but um, I know that there's a lot of uh, restraints on those apartments. They're very small. It's not like a single person could buy a big, big place. Right. Here's here's something. I've lived in Tokyo. I lived in Seoul. Lived in Singapore. Lectured through. Anyway, there was something in Seoul, a very Confucius Confucian society. It's probably changed. That if a radiant young, let's say, alpha woman goes beyond the undergrad into the master's, into the PhD, or becomes a professional they are at a greater risk of not getting married. Is mm. this the case in Singapore? That could probably be the case. I don't know for sure, but... If the parents women, want them married by 25, can they yeah. continue to study for their yeah, MD? they continue to study, yes. At the, uh, the society does really encourage that kind of study. They do further studies and... Yeah. So they can start mm -hmm. to have their children and then continue they can their, their studies. And they can have a maid and they can ha their grandparents will, can take care of the child. Well, that's okay. So let's talk about the warts you in the Western. You have family unit support. Yeah, here. let's talk about the, the conflict in the Western society with a professional woman who goes further, gets her, her master's, her MD, her law degree, her whatever, and she, right now, when she hits 30 and no guy is lined up, she thinks about freezing her eggs. You know, just to leave that option open in her late 30s. You know, so many women waiting for their late 30s to have babies. What, uh, is there a balance between the two? It's in the Southeast Asian society, get married by 25, have your babies, return to your studies, or the Western... But it, it, women are not, women are um, having children later, and um, uh, yeah, not having not having so many children. Um, this is what Singapore's also worried about. This uh, as as Tokyo is as, as Japan, one of the older um, a society with the largest a very large elderly population. Well, so aging societies, post-industrial societies of lower birth rates. They're, they're concerned about women not having children. I mean, I could fix the problem. They just don't ask me. How do you, but, how would you fix that? <laughs> it's the design of the place. There's no, there's no place for privacy. In My Japan, students, in Japan. No, in Singapore. My poor students cannot heights outside my building. PDA, um, public displays of affections are not. Well, you, can't do, you can't do anything. You can't have a private space. I'm sure in New York you can find a place to have a private conversation. Well, you kids, cannot, it's on park benches. PDAs are not taboo yeah, here. Just a little park bench or something. You know, the lights, the cameras, the... You know, you, you just can't have any privacy. So PDAs, and, public displays of affection, are suspect. Well, I, I don't know about that, but, um, but uh, there, you don't want to do, you, a lot of people don't feel like doing that out in the blaring lights, you know. You, but if there was more darkness and you let us feel the night, we don't even feel the night over here with with stadium-like lights oh, wow. outside the window. So, um, you so know, is our, this our a concerted att attack on nature? <laughs> it is definitely an attack on nature, on my rhythmic, you know, my nocturnal clock, you know. Um, 
The lights so are always I, on. I think the students would get together more and and be able to have a little more privacy and and you'd have a lot more romance. Okay, just this, we're almost done, but talk about that in notion in um, cities have often formed as a way to diversify the gene pool for 6,000 years. Um, they're cosmopolitan, they're diverse, they're filled with attractive strangers, the other is there with you, you're able to diversify the gene pool and make a stronger society, more cosmopolitan. Talk about romance in Singapore. On a scale of 1 to 10, where would you place romance in Singapore? Two. Uh, number two <laughs> and there's a recent um documentary i saw on romance in japan it's like a pathetic two also so what is mm -hmm. what is going on in general of course okay. gang we're generalizing but what is I'm going space the spaces there's no space for privacy so younger people might desire it but there's no place to go to be alone yeah, Exactly. I think they would desire it, but there's no place to go. There's no place to even develop uh, a more intimate friendship because, you know, there's blaring lights on you all the time and you are occupied. You, you have so much, you know, you have a... a, a you know your time is just taken it's it's scheduled oh scheduled to death um, and and before you, know when, I first, you yeah. know when i'm from baltimore and and so baltimore you know violence to me was like blood and guts right <laughs> the the murder rate just can't seem to come down anyway um but here i got here and i said oh great you know there's no violence here and and there isn't and i'm really happy I can never have to worry. I can leave my door open. I can forget things. And, and I never have to It's a to very honest society open. that way. But, but I realized that I don't recognize the violence because of what I'm used to. But when your kid, you know, when your, your students say to you, oh, Prof. Kelly, I'm so boring. All my, all I did my whole life was go to school, do four hours of homework, and go to sleep. You know, you keep your Without kid a like romantic a, or intimate life with even experimenting as a teenager. You keep your kid like a prisoner. That's a violence. Let's, let's talk at the end. We, th we think modernity is this thing where the individual, and, and, and Zygmunt Bauman and Giddens and uh, Ulrich Beck talk about micro-modernity, working out the the ascension of the individual and that brings me to the concept we've been talking about cisgender people the 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 allowance for a gay life i would imagine is still very closeted yeah but we 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 just don't think of it like that here there isn't this idea of identifying yourself as gay or as whatever. cisgender it, I, I don't think people, I, I think there's a lot of activity happening, but... But um, and according to you, where's the secret places where they can go <laughs> off and have a romance if they're glaring lights and surveillance cameras and, everywhere? And, and, and your time is totally occupied. And your you time know? is and occupied. you sleep. <laughs> because I sense that frustration there with, just like in Protestant cultures, Confucian cultures that were that life is so occupied with the compulsion of work that there wasn't oh, yeah. a sliver for anyone to have romance. It's in right. general there's a lot of these cultures. A little bit of play, um, experimentation. You know, here, you're you're so you have so many uh, so many forces trying to take your time. When you do have a little time off, you start to. <gasps> panic a little bit oh my god is there something i'm supposed to be doing how come i f Wait oh i should be I having a romance i should be <laughs> having a romance as a bucket <laughs> list I have to do right now okay and you start to get a little paranoid um well yeah. joan kelly professor world traveler um americana um this has been wonderful i think we we covered this notion of Singapore as 
you know, it hits the top 10. I do love that city for, even with its flaws and contradictions, um, very clean, very beautiful, very green, um, very w a weird blend of, of things that were almost very socialist with kind of very rigid rules. Um, what, on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you categorize Singapore as a global, truly global city? Well, you know, uh, there's one phenomenon that I think we should mention. We're here in our little, you know, our small spot of Singapore, but we are so close to Malaysia, to Thailand, to Indonesia. Oh, I remember uh, Cambodia, <laughs> Vietnam, you know. Exactly. That we all, you know, when I think of Singapore, I think of, I, I think of myself as part of all of these countries that are around surrounding us. Right. I don't just think Singapore. I think of our neighborhood. And hence, I think hence the Switzerland-like. Yeah. Yeah. The the the, the um, influence and the just the um, the food, the culture, the workers, the exchange. The exchange. exchange. I remember right. those Thursday night yeah. Tiger. Airways brokering tickets that you know seven dollar flights to Bangkok from from I'm, I know those <laughs> days those days are long <laughs> over pro probably but, but still, could you know before the pandemic we could fly you know so many places good old Holy Tiger God. Airlines your food dress everything you're three hours to India you're four hours to China four four hours to Calcutta. Wow. Um, I, oh my God, I miss Calcutta so much. It's yeah. a very vibrant city. It's a very vibrant city. I wonder how it's going to be after this pandemic. I'm really worried about it. Oh, right. But, um, yeah, I mean, in India, you can know everybody in the neighborhood in about two weeks. Wow. You know, that's all you need. Everybody is so sociable. And they they reach out and they want to know who you are and they want to talk and you know I would give my phone number out to everybody and they'd be calling oh, you man, up. Can you come down and talk? You know my evenings were just spent on the street talking to people. Wow, that's a beautiful uh, public culture. Joan, yeah, it really is. thank you very much for this this section. See you later and um, if. We, we hope to see you back in Singapore sometime. We'll hope to come there soon. But I want to, after, even after this class, I want to continue this series on cities and cells, talking about people living all over the world in this notion of a global cosmopolitan sensibility. So thank you very much, Joan. I am going to stop.